Hello, good afternoon, Salamat Tengahari. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eleanor Slade and I've recently moved from the University of Oxford where I was coordinating the Lombok project. So nothing to do with the island of Lombok, it stands for Land Use Options for Maintaining Biodiversity and Ecosystem Functions um, and was based at the SAFE project, so the Stability of Altered Forest Ecosystems project, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, which is based in Tawau. And so a lot of the work I'm going to talk to you about today was done under the Lombok project, which ran from 2015 until the end of 2018. And so this project was sponsored um, or funded by NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council um, in the UK, um, but also with some funding to Matt and myself um, through the Newton um, Fund and the um, MITE project. So I'm now based at the Asian School of the Environment at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, and I thought this was a really great move because I could continue to easily work in Sabah and come across um, for meetings. Um, but um, this doesn't seem to quite have worked out. So I'm now so near and yet I'm still so far, but at least I can join you um, on Zoom today. And I hope this recording is, is okay. It's the first um, time I've done a, a video um, recording. So I'd like to start by thanking Agnes and Melissa and Daisy and Mickling and the directors of EPD and DID and the whole of the organizing committee for organizing these workshops um, and for inviting Matt and um, Jake and myself to come and share some of the work that we've been doing with you all today. Um, and of course, thank you all um, for coming. So I think Agnes has given a really nice introduction and overview of the Rytree project. And I'm really super excited to see how this project has grown over the years since we started it in 2016. Um, and now that we've got um, the further Newton um, funding to continue to work with you all on this and to develop the um, decision tree tool. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to give you an overview of the early science that we did um, that helped inform our policy brief um, that we produced in 2017. Um, and then Jake's going to follow on to talk about some of the modelling that he's been doing um, using this baseline um, data to upscale the resu um, results to the landscape um, level and to riparian areas across Saba. And then in the next workshop, Matt's going to um, expand on the science that we've been doing um, since the policy brief was produced in 2017. Um, and some of the um, exciting science that's come out um, since then um, and bringing um, all of our results together into um, some meta-analysis uh, meta to help fill the gaps that we've identified. So apologies to some of you who've probably heard um, most of this before, but we thought it's a really good idea to start um, at the beginning um, and to really just refresh us all about um, where we actually started from. So what are riparian buffers? So when we talk about riparian buffers, um, these are also known um, as riparian reserves, riparian corridors, riparian zones, or um, riparian margins. And these are usually strips of natural or restored vegetation by the side of waterways within um, agricultural areas or commercial forest areas. And the IUCN guidelines for conserving connectivity have just been produced um, and so they're really talking about connectivity conservation and ecological corridors. Um, and this is what riparian um, buffer strips can really act as. So they can provide this really good supporting role for protected areas and build ecological networks across a whole landscape. So when we think of the potential benefits of riparian buffers, we tend to think um, about things like maintaining hydrology, water quality, reducing um, erosion, or maintaining habitat for freshwater biodiversity. And so this was what the um, Saba water enactment was really um, built upon, was looking at these benefits. Um, but there are potentially other benefits to riparian buffers. So things like um, carbon storage, um, habitat for terrestrial biodiversity in the riparian buffer area and as movement corridors and dispersal corridors across the landscape 
and also ecosystem services for surrounding um, agriculture. And of course, converse to that, um, our farm managers always like to tell me, there's the potential for ecosystem disservices. So for pest species to spill over from the um, riparian buffer area into the oil palm plantation um, and potentially cause um, damage to the crops. And this is something I'll talk about a bit later. So what are the current guidelines for riparian um, buffer strips? So national guidelines are highly variable. In Sabah, um, you've got 20 meter um, reserves on each side of the river for rivers that are greater than three meters wide. Um, but this also differs. So in forest um, reserve areas, this I think can be 30 meters each side of the river. And then EPD and uh, EIA um, assessments can extend these widths as well. So for example, for wildlife corridors. In Peninsula Malaysia and Sarawak, um, we've got variable guidelines depending on the width um, of the river. And then in Indonesia, it's 50 meters on all rivers um, um, from zero to 30 meters um, wide. So we've also been um, working a bit with the RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Oil Palm, to work on their guidelines for riparian reserves. Um, and the RSPO has come up with these context specific guidelines. So depending on the width of the river, depending on the whether the river is used for domestic use, whether um, it might be important as a wildlife um, corridor, and that determines how wide um, the riparian um, reserve should be on each side of the river. And these simplified guidelines can be downloaded um, from the RSPO um, website. And so what the RSPO has done, it's just updated its principles and criteria last year, and it's actually included um, best management practices for managing and rehabilitating um, and restoring riparian um, areas within oil palm plantations. So now if you're going for RSPO certification, then you're going to need to have to consider um, management um, of your riparian areas and then potentially um, restoring and rehabilitating them to meet RSPO standards. So that's great, we've got these guidelines and we have these criteria, but what we weren't sure about is how much of a strong scientific evidence base there is for these variable and different um, widths. And so we conducted um, a rapid evidence appraisal of the whole of the scientific literature that we could find um, for riparian areas within agricultural zones. And what we found was while there was quite a lot of data for temperate regions on how wide riparian reserves um, should be, ranging from um, 20 to sort of 60 meters, if you're considering things like bank stabilization or water functioning, up to much wider widths of around um, 160 meters for um, wildlife corridors or wildlife support. But most of this was for temperate regions. And in tropical regions, there's very little literature out there at all to tell us how wide a riparian um, buffer strip should be for different um, functions. So what we set um, out to do as part of our um, Lombok um, and Newton funded project was to look at widths of um, rivers across a landscape. So based in the SAFE project um, down in Tawau where they've marked out some rivers, um, we selected 23 rivers um, which um, had buffer strips of different widths. We also had some rivers in forest um, catchment areas, so up in the um, continuous areas of forest to act as kind of our control sites. And then we also had rivers within oil palm plantations that didn't have any buffer strips at all. And then we had 18 rivers with buffer strips of different, um, different widths, so everything from 10 meters up to around 500 meter widths. And so, in those um, riparian areas, we measured a whole range of indicator species, so measured various biodiversity. So things like um, the large mammals, the carnivores, the small mammals, so things like bats, which I think Matt will talk about um, in the next workshop. 
We measured the aquatic vertebrates, we measured birds, um, and um, of course we measured dung beetles because that's my um, favourite um, organism. We also measured the environmental conditions of the river and the um, riparian buffer. So we measured things like the water quality, the organic matter and sediments, the river structure. We also looked at vegetation plots um, in the um, riparian buffer area and um, calculated carbon stocks. We also looked at microclimate. So we used temperature and humidity data loggers to record the microclimate as well as using LIDAR data. So some of Greg Asner's LIDAR data and also the NERC um, LIDAR flights over the safe area. And that gives us remotely sensed data. So we can look at things like the topography, forest structure, microclimate. Um, and again, I think um, our PhD student has produced some really nice results of the microclimate data and how that changes um, in, across the different um, riparian widths, and Matt will present this um, to you in the next workshop. So as well as the um, structure and the biodiversity, we also measured a few ecosystem um, functions. So some of our colleagues at um, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Edinburgh did some monitoring of the emissions from the soil. So they measured things like um, carbon dioxide emissions, nitrous oxide, methane emissions. Um, we looked at soil nutrient cycling by um, measuring the amount of turnover of dung um, from the dung beetles back into the soil. Um, and um, we measured the um, carbon stocks or carbon storage. So this was our experimental um, setup and we were busy setting up all these um, rivers. Um, when HOB Heart of Borneo um, arrived in 2016. And so this was really the beginning um, of our collaboration. And the Heart of Borneo topic that year was um, the science policy interface um, and how that can work for conservation priorities in Sabah. And so Agnes was really keen that rather than having the typical format where scientists would produce and present their science um, for other scientists and policymakers might have sessions where they discuss policy, that she would really try and link up um, scientists with policymakers. So she decided to pair a scientist with a government agency or policymaking um, person um, and run several sessions. So she ran one on oil palm um, sustainability, one on forest restoration, and one on um, riparian buffers. And so for the riparian buffer one, she paired um, myself and um, Micklin together. So this was the first time that I um, met um, Micklin. And so we ran this workshop um, on how to integrate what science was being done and what the knowledge gaps and what policymakers wanted to know. And I think this was very eye-opening for both myself um, and for Micklin because this was the first time I'd really um, engaged with um, a policymaker and and actually to find out like what are the questions that you're interested in what are the knowledge gaps that you would like um, to know about and can we address these with our science are we addressing them or do we also need to look at other things that we're doing um, to help you provide that scientific evidence base and I think for Micklin, um, it was very interesting because he had been thinking a bit about, well, what about other benefits of riparian reserves apart from just water? Um, but he didn't know that we were really out there thinking about doing some of this research and that some of that scientific evidence base did exist, but it existed in papers and in, in things that weren't accessible um, to him. So Agnes's main message was really don't um, communicate to decision makers or don't just communicate among yourself or do projects where you think, OK, I'm going to do this project, produce this science and then give it to a decision maker, but actually communicate with decision makers. And so actually scientists and decision makers coming together and designing projects together and working um, on projects together and communicating together um, with each other. And so after this um, workshop, we had a really um, interesting meeting at um, DID where um, four of us scientists, so myself and Lonnie Baking from UMS, um, came together and um, talked about some of the science work um, that we were doing. 
And DID shared with us that um, they were thinking of reviewing the riparian guidelines in um, the coming years and wanted to consider a range of benefits. Um, and then it really became obvious to us, well, perhaps we can help them provide some of that evidence um, base to look at biodiversity within, um, within riparian reserves. And so one of the outcomes of this meeting was that actually this science base, the science that we're producing is really not often accessible to local decision makers actually on the ground. Um, and so we discussed like what we could do about this and we thought we could do um, two things. So one thing was to actually review the literature to bring all the science together and to summarize it and to see what was known already. And then also was to take the science that we were doing and actually produce some policy briefs. So not just publish these in scientific papers, but to produce some science briefs um, that would be more accessible to government agencies and decision makers and people on the ground. So what we've identified are some of the issues surrounding being able to develop effective management of riparian buffer areas. So things like the, um, having an accessible science base, um, having variable guidelines um, around that, depending on um, which state you're in or whether you're following RSPO guidelines, um, that most of the time we're not considering a full range of benefits. So we're mostly just considering water quality, um, and that there seems to be little evidence um, for riparian buffer effectiveness um, within tropical regions. And so we wanted to use this collaboration to address this in three ways. So the first thing that we decided to do was a review of the current literature um, to actually look at what evidence um, was out there. So what we did was we produced a paper um, in a policy direction piece um, in the Journal of Applied Ecology. So it's open access as well. So it's accessible to anybody, anybody can download this. Um, and it showed, as I showed you in a previous slide, that there's very little data um, for the tropics in general. So most of the um, evidence or science surrounding riparian widths of riparian um, buffers in tropical ag in agriculture comes from temperate regions and not from the tropics. Um, so apart from needing more science and um, more research, um, what we found was that we identified several gaps. Um, so there's a need for clear buffer designs. Um, and this is really where we decided um, perhaps we should look at this decision tree um, approach and look at um, what are the minimum width thresholds um, in different context um, specific situations um, and to involve a huge range of um, stakeholders in trying to draw up that um, for SABA. We also identified a need um, for um, survey protocols, so standard survey protocols to help with monitoring um, um, riparian buffers and, um, for example, the restoration. Um, then another gap was guidelines for rehabilitation and restoration. So some of this has been addressed now by the RSPO um, simplified guidelines. Um, that, um, that are available that we've been working with them on. There's also a project in um, Sumatra in Indonesia run by the University of Cambridge and Smartree, um, which is looking at um, restoration of riparian buffers in oil palm um, areas. And that's going to hopefully, hopefully um, provide um, some, some good outcomes from that. Um, and the final thing that we um, highlighted as a potential gap is that to do this and to come up with these um, kind of guidelines um, and approaches really requires closer collaboration and improved data sharing between scientists, decision makers and environmental management. Um, so that we really have a knowledge exchange both on the science, so the science that's being produced, but also that the scientists are informed, well, what are the sorts of questions that policy makers um, and people who are managing riparian um, areas want? And so we're asking the right questions and we're producing science that is actually um, useful. And that's where I think that this wider collaboration that we have um, has really um, made a difference because we're really uh, working on this um, all together.
So the second um, thing that we wanted to do to address the knowledge gaps, um, particularly in considering the full range of benefits of riparian reserves, was to conduct some field research into the um, effectiveness of riparian buffers um, for terrestrial um, bi biodiversity. So we identified five key questions um, which we thought that um, our science um, that we were doing around the SAFE project area could help us address. So first was what biodiversity is supported or what terrestrial biodiversity is supported by riparian buffers? Are riparian buffers important for carbon storage? How wide do riparian buffers within our palm agriculture um, need to be? whether riparian buffers are harboring um, pest species and whether they might act as dispersal corridors um, or movement corridors for wildlife across the landscape. So the first question, whether riparian buffers are supporting biodiversity. So here we found um, that yes, riparian buffers are very important for supporting biodiversity. So on this um, figure here, we've got um, different measures of biodiversity, so small mammals, birds, dung beetles, and dragonflies and damselflies. And the green bars are the number of species that are found in riparian reserves. Um, and the um, orange bars are the number of species that are found along rivers in all palm plantations that do not have a riparian reserve. Um, and this dotted line across the top um, is um, the species that are found in forested rivers. So those are rivers in continuous areas of forest around the, the safe landscape. And so what we can see is that riparian buffers um, in oil palm plantations are supporting 63 to over 100 percent of the species that are known from nearby forested um, rivers. Um, and definitely they're supporting more species than rivers that don't have any buffer next to them. So they use orange bars here. The only difference is the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, and that's probably because um, these insects really rely very much on the water rather than on the vegetation um, on the side of the river. So of course, this is just the number of species and the composition or the types of species you get might change a bit. So Riparian reserves are typically made up of some forest species, but also some of the more generalist species that are found in agriculture as well. And the wider the riparian reserve, the more of the forest species it's going to have. But what we did find as well, particularly when we looked at the birds, was that these riparian reserves are also um, containing quite a number of species that are, are, are of conservation concern. So, this was for the data that we had in 2017. We've now got much more data, uh, including data for large mammals and for bats and also for the microclimate. Um, and so Matt is going to present some of this updated um, data to you in the next um, workshop. So the second question, whether riparian buffers um, store carbon. So it was very clear from this figure. So this is the um, amount of carbon and riparian reserves are storing as much carbon um, as areas of um, forested, um, forested areas in um, rivers in forested um, areas in the continuous forest. So definitely very important in terms of carbon storage and they're storing a lot more carbon than um, oil palm areas are storing. So riparian buffers really can contribute significantly to a statewide um, carbon assessment. So for example, if oil palm companies are using something like the, the HCS um, approach, then these riparian um, buffer areas could really help to contribute to their carbon assessments. So the third question, um, how wide do riparian buffers need to be? So as was found for the um, temperate regions, wider riparian buffers are supporting more biodiversity. But what we can see if you look at these figures, so this is the riparian reserve width along the bottom, and this is for birds um, as well as for beetles. Um, and so here we can see that riparian reserves of um, 20 meters wide on each side of the bank are actually conserving quite a lot of the species that you might find in a patch of continuous um, forest. 
But if you can extend that by just 10 or 20 meters to 40 meters um, wide on each side of your river, then you're probably going to be conserving about the same number of species as you would in a forested um, area. So even these small differences in um, the number of meters that you have on each side of the river can really make big differences um, to biodiversity. But of course, as you increase the riparian reserve width, you get um, more species in there. And particularly for bigger species, we think, um, so for some of the bigger mammals, or if you want that to really act as a corridor, um, then we would recommend having wider widths of, um, say, up to 100 metres um, each alongside each of the rivers. Um, and I think Jake will talk about this um, next. So in terms of pest species, so this was always something that whenever I talked to oil palm managers or presented at RSPO meetings, um, they, would, they would question us about. Um, and what we've really found is several um, studies now have found that these riparian reserves don't, do not really seem to be harboring pest species. So some work by Claudia Gray showed that um, herbivory rates, so here you've got the percentage of leaf area on an oil palm that is lost. Um, in oil palms where you've got um, a riparian um, reserve next to the oil palm plantation, and here would be a, um, an oil palm plantation without any riparian reserve. And you can see there's really not very much difference. So it doesn't seem like these insect pests are spilling over from the riparian reserve into the oil palm plantation and causing higher um, um, damage to the oil palms. Similarly, if we look at um, pest rat populations, what we find is that the pest rats are very, very high in the oil palm areas, um, but you get very low abundances of these in riparian areas and in forested um, areas by rivers as well. So these pest rat populations really seem to be living um, within the oil palm plantations themselves. They're not coming from the riparian reserves and going into the oil palm plantations. And there's been some recent um, work also by Philip Chapman, um, which has found similar results to um, the results that we got here. So two of the other pest species, um, so Ganoderma, which is a fungus that affects oil palm, and then the rhinoceros beetle, the Erictes beetle, um, that's thought to cause damage to oil palm. Um, so I've recently got a grant, um, which I hope to be able to start um, this year as soon as I can come over, which will also look at these pest species. And that's particularly important in relation to rehabilitation or restoring um, riparian areas, because the oil palm managers say that these species particularly live in the dead wood. And so if you have areas um, of riparian reserves that, are, that have a lot of dead wood in them, or where you've left the oil palm, um, old oil palm, um, as a kind of reserve boundary um, to grow and re rehabilitate that riparian reserve, that these pest species might then spill out from those riparian in areas into the oil palm plantation that you've just replanted. And so this is really a concern for them, and this is something that I hope that we can address over the next couple of years. So finally, what about riparian reserves serving as dispersal or as movement corridors for wildlife? So I know there's been quite a bit of work on this, um, for example, for big mammals, so things like the elephants, I think Dano Girang and Benoit have done some work on this and shown that potentially the riparian reserves um, could act as um, wildlife corridors, although I think the elephants also have fixed um, movement patterns where they like to go. But we were quite interested to have a look at this for um, smaller species. And so it's quite difficult to, um, to mark up or to radio track um, large mammals or birds across landscapes. So this is where small things like um, the insects and the invertebrates um, can be quite important. So here, the dung beetles, um, what we can do is we can mark them up. So we put small um, markings on the elytra, on the wing cases of the beetles, and then we let them go and then we can track how they move across the landscape. And what we found is that 
Um, beetles really do seem to use these um, riparian buffer strips as movement corridors. So particularly for forest species, what we found is that they very rarely actually um, spill over and go into the old palm plantation. They seem to be moving up and down these corridors and moving from the forest um, up and down um, the forest patches along these corridors, but they're not really um, able to cross into the old palm areas. There are a few species, these generalist species, which will use the oil palm areas, but the majority of species, particularly forest species, are, are in fact using these corridors. So this could be particularly important. These reserves could be particularly important for forest specialist species that would not be able to cross this agricultural landscape unless there's this patch of um, forest for them to move across. Um, and some of you might say, okay, but this is, these are just small insect species, but of course, the insects provide quite a, um, a good baseline. So they provide um, food, for example, for bats, um, for small mammals, for birds. Um, they're also, of course, the dung beetles are good indicators of mammal species because they feed on the mammal dung. So if you've got um, good um, numbers of dung beetles, it probably means you've got good um, mammal populations in your riparian reserves. And of course, many of these insects are important. Um, so for example, the dung beetles are important for nutrient recycling and for plant growth. Other species like bees and butterflies are important for um, pollination. So what these species are doing gives us a good indication of what um, other um, bigger things might be doing in the environment as well. So the output of this was um, this riparian brief, um, which summarised basically the results that I've just been showing you now. So we published these results in scientific um, papers, but then we also produced this brief um, to make the science more accessible to policymakers and decision makers on the ground. And basically that summarised that riparian buffers are important for bi terrestrial biodiversity, for carbon storage, for movement of wildlife, in addition to providing um, good water quality and hydrology. So we do feel that we really um, are beginning to have that scientific evidence base now for Sabah and for the tropics. Um, we also suggest that um, to really help terrestrial biodiversity and help connectivity, we would recommend if we could increase riparian buffer areas where we think it's important for terrestrial biodiversity to say 40 meters wide, um, then this would really help preserve the biodiversity within Sabah. Um, but we might need greater width. So we might need to have some context specific guidelines um, um, where buffers might be important for wildlife corridors or for, for bigger mammals. And so a year later, at the heart of Borneo in 2017, um, Micklin and I presented um, this um, riparian um, brief. So that was really a lot. Um, it was really a great accomplishment one year later. Um, and what we did is we did something which I think is quite unusual, that we gave a presentation together um, at the HOB. So this was both the science um, and the um, policy makers presenting together um, at a conference. And I think this is something um, that is, that's not really done. And since then, we've also um, been to um, other conferences, so to some of the science conferences as well, to actually show this collaboration and show that scientists and policy makers should be and can be working together to develop the science um, and the policy right from the, from the ground up. So what's been really great, as um, Agnes showed in her slides, is that this um, collaboration um, between us has really grown and grown and grown. And I think this is really now um, a great collaboration, both between local and international scientists. So we work a lot with um, the students and professors at UMS and a lot of the science that I've shown and that Matt will show um, at the next workshop actually comes from um, UMS um, students and collaborators. Um, but also working with the government agencies and that we've grown from just working with DID to then working with EPD, uh, with um, presenting with, to DOA, to lands and surveys, and also including um, civil societies like Pongo Alliance and, um, and also oil palm um, companies um, as well, like so it's Kinabalu. Um, so this is... Um, really something I think that actually is, is quite unusual and I'm really happy um, that I can be part of it. 
So thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I'm really happy to take um, any questions if um, the Zoom is working. Um, and now I'll pass over to Jake, who is going to talk about how some of this um, data that I just mentioned um, is being used to model riparian buffer wicks um, across the landscape. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>